Good morning, church. Good to have you with us today. If you're a guest with us, great to have you as well. If you're in the lobby, we'd love to have you in as well. Uh, so come and join us. We're going to sing this morning and share uh, our praise to our Lord and Savior through music. And we're going to start by remembering that our Lord is alive and well. Let's sing it. get you moving this morning we do serve a risen savior and uh i want to just remind you that uh walter's class still has some slots available so if you want to sign up for walter's class it's back here at the sign up center right out in the foyer and you can get into his fellowship class for this new quarter that starts in october uh there's other announcements in your bulletin so don't miss out on anything uh let's have a word of prayer and then we'll greet each other this morning let's pray Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the uh, sunshine, for uh, just a beautiful day that you've blessed us with, the opportunity, the privilege we have of uh, coming together as a family of Christ and to uh, fellowship, to enjoy uh, being with each other, to meet around your table, just everything that's a part of this day. Lord, we thank you that we can be a part of it. Lord, we just pray that your, your blessings on, on us, and we just pray that uh, everything that's said and done today will glorify you and lift you up and that you'll be praised. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let us greet.
before the world was made, before you spoke it to be. You were the King of kings, yeah, you were, yeah, you were. And now you're reigning still, enthroned above all things. Angels and saints cry out, we join them as we sing. sing glory to God. We sing glory to his great name uh, because uh, we've been in the book of Revelation for some time and that's something you see uh, quite often in Revelation already even though we're just part way through is uh, God's name being praised and singing being done and so let's continue that same idea as we sing about God's great name together today. Jesus. 
The chorus says, you are worthy, and the Lamb was slain for us. And that's, of course, vital for us as Christians, because nothing but the blood could save us. And so Jesus had to be slain. He had to go to the cross. He had to die for our sins, because that was the only way to appease the wrath of God for our sins. Nothing but the blood. Morning. morning. Yesterday, 11 September, marked the 20th anniversary of the cowardly terrorist attack on our country. That was a moment in time no one would ever forget, especially those who were alive and old enough to comprehend what was happening. Those of us who witnessed that day can remember where we were and what we were doing at that specific time. It is, a, it is indeed a time for us to never forget and for us to remember those we lost as we lift up in prayer all who were affected in some way by this dastardly deed. In a few moments, we will partake in communion together as a church family. It is a ritual that we practice each week in remembrance of the sacrifice our Lord Jesus Christ made for us securing our salvation for all time. But for a lot of us older folks, sometimes remembering can be a bit difficult. Cindy and I have been married now for 35 years. And yes, or, I'm sorry, 38 years. Yeah, 38. <laughs> sorry, dear, sorry. And yes, like most married people, we also argue sometimes. But being the man that I am, I always remember to get the last two words in after an argument. Something to the effect, 
Yes, dear. <laughs> Isn't it wonderful that God has given us a memory? That which sets us apart from all other living creatures. But often we find ourselves racking our brains, trying to remember persons, place, events, or simply what happened to that thing I just had in my hand, okay? Well, if this describes you, then you need help right away, you know? No, just kidding, this, this is common for all of us, actually. But as Christians, the Lord's Supper is an event we shall never forget, an event worthy of celebration. Luke 22, verse 19 says, and he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave unto them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The words do this in remembrance of me are words spoken throughout the world in churches and religious gatherings and are words to be taken in the most literal sense for both remembrance and obedience to the clear command of Jesus. Jesus knew that his disciples as humans would forget some things. Therefore, he gave them memory aids to assist them in struggles and proclamation of the gospel. At the beginning of his ministry, Jesus submitted the ordinance of baptism. At the end of his ministry, he instituted the ordinance of the Lord's Supper, that which we celebrate together as communion. The bread sustains, and the bread and the blood assures us a cleaning. We can find comfort partaking in the Lord's Supper, and we can also find comfort knowing that it is actually a combination of both the old and the new. The old, with the celebration of the Lord's Supper, the Passover meal became instantly obsolete. The Passover meal memorialized Israel's deliverance from the bondage of Egypt when the death angel passed over all the Israelite homes displaying the blood of the lamb. And the new, with the institution of the Lord's Supper and the Lord's death on the cross, the very next day, Jesus became the Lamb of God that would take away the sin of the world. And as the Lamb, we keep and save all those who trust in him. Let us pray. Lord, as we come to partake in the bread and wine, we come in meekness of heart and humility of spirit, knowing that we cannot approach you in our own righteousness, but only because of your great goodness and gracious mercy in sending your only begotten son to die on a cross in our place and to pay the price of our sin. As we partake of the symbols of the bread and wine, we eat and drink in remembrance of your son who died for us and rose again, knowing that he has come to us, both our Lord and Savior, Help us to live in newness of life and walk worthy before you all the days of our lives. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Grab your uh, bulletin. Inside that bulletin is a handout with uh, the messages outlined today. As we, uh, as Bob said, in connecting Revelation with the songs, we're 
only, and I, I, here's what I heard. I don't know what you heard, but here's why I heard him stress. We're only partway through it. So <laughs> we are only partway through it. Uh, it's just taking a while to work through this. We're still in chapter 11, but chapter 11 is loaded. Rome is going to persecute the church of God. The Bible said it. History bears it out that it happened. But she will survive. That's the picture given to John from the first vision in chapter 11. The measuring of the temple, the trampling of the holy city for 42 months. Then John is told that God grants authority to his two witnesses to prophesy for 1,260 days. The two witnesses are the Word of God and the people of God. They are unstoppable. They're going to do what God's told them to do, and He's going to make sure it gets done. They have the same power, and here's what's connected. The, the church has the same power that Elijah had when he shut up the heavens for three and a half years. They have the same power that Moses had when he turned the water into blood and, and uh, brought plagues upon Egypt. It doesn't mean they're going to use that power the same way or that God's going to use that the same way. The point is the power that caused those things to happen is the power that God has given the church to make sure that whatever he wants them to happen is going to happen. That's the jest there, okay? That's what we need to understand. The jest of these illustrations is that God is behind all of this, and he's not going to be stopped no matter who thinks they're going to do it. Basically, we ended last week's sermon in the middle of verse 7, chapter 11, verse 7, with the witnesses finishing their testimony. So let's pick up again in chapter 11, starting in verse 7. Here's what's written. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that symbolically is called Sodom and Egypt, where the Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, some from the peoples of, and tribes and languages and nations will gaze at their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in a tomb. And those who dwell on earth will rejoice over them and make merry and exchange presents, because these two prophets had been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. But after the three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them, and they stood up on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies watched them. And at that hour there was great, a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. Seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake. And the rest were terrified and gave glory to God of heaven. The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is soon to come. All right, before we get into the specific explanation of this passage we just read, let me explain kind of an overall understanding of Jewish thought and writings. You need to grab this, okay? They don't always, the, the Eastern mind, and that's what Judaism is considered, the Eastern mind does not always write in chronological order like we Westerners prefer. They do write in sequences. They group related things together, but those sequences aren't always in chronological order like we would expect. I think it's uh, Shane Woods that brings that out. You guys who go through the Shane Woods thing, uh, he brings out the fact of how the Eastern mind writes compared to what we do, okay? We see that type of writing, the, the sequence but not the chronological order, we see that type of writing all through Revelation. As I've said before, Revelation is not a straight through book. And that's where people get messed up. We think that, hap that this happened, that this happened. No, it, it's cyclical. It keeps going back and repeating itself. There's a lot of repeating, a lot of recycling. For example, the seven trumpets, for the most part, and that's where we're at right now, we're in the seven trumpets, if you remember. The seven trumpets fit within the time frame of the seven seals. They just kind of go back and explain it a little bit differently, okay? Think about this. The breaking of the second seal was the red horse. Does anybody remember what the red horse stood for? War. Right, war. Well, when you get to the sixth trumpet, you have 200 million horsemen coming from the east to bring war. It's just going back and giving a little bit more detail to it. These are not two separate events. They are showing that God is going to use war to judge Rome. The trumpet just makes it a little bit more specific than the second seal did. You're going to see the same thing again when we get to the seven bowls, okay? 
Two weeks ago, when we got into chapter 11, the first thing we saw was the measuring of the temple, which represented God protecting His own. Yet at the same time, we also saw the holy city being trampled for 42 months, which represents Rome persecuting the church. Two separate events that happened to the same group, the church, at the same time. God is protecting His church while it's being trampled, okay? Just two different perspectives. All of this has been said to help you understand today's message. John sees two visions in sequence, but not necessarily in chronological order. The first vision is the two witnesses. And everything that we're told is told about the two witnesses right off the bat. They prophesy for 1,260 days, and then we are shown that they are faithful, they are protected, they are powerful, they are unstoppable. Then we come to the second sequence, okay, which is on your outline, the beast. The beast makes war on the witnesses and conquers them and kills them. That is not all in chronological order, folks. The vision is sequential because it talks all about the two witnesses at the beginning. It's sequential in the fact that it talks about the, two, the beast at the end. But the fact is that some of what's told about the witnesses and some of what's told about the beast overlap. Are you following me with this so far? Okay. We know they overlap for this reason. The beast does not wait for the witnesses to finish their testimony before he makes war on them. We know that. Because what is going on at the same time as the witnesses are testifying? Go back to the first vision. The holy city, which is the same as the two witnesses, the church and the word, the holy city is being trampled. All right? The beast is making war on it. You've got to get your head wrapped around this, how they wrote, okay? While the two witnesses, the church testifying through the word, the holy city, the church, while it is being trampled, it's also witnessing. We know this because the time frame is the same. The holy city, which is the church, is trampled for 42 months. Yet we're told the witnesses do their prophesying and they're witnessing their testimony for 1,260 days. We're told in chapter 13, verse 5, I know I'm jumping ahead a little bit, we're told that the beast is allowed to exercise its authority for 42 months. Same time frame, all of this is going on. Are you with me? Are you with me on this? You understand it's all happening at the same time for the most part. The vision of the temple and the holy city lets us know that the beast has already risen from the bottomless pit and is making war against the church. In the vision, the first vision, it's implied, but it's not directly stated. And the reason that John doesn't directly state it is because his focus on the first vision is not the beast. His focus on the first vision is, here's what the church of God's going to do. She's going to rise up and she's going to prophesy for a certain amount of time and she's going to be unstoppable. You can't say that and then the next thing say, and then she dies. <laughs> but he's going to get to that, okay? He's just, in the first sequence, it's all about the church. In the second sequence, it's all about the beast, okay? So we move from the first, about the church being unstoppable, we move to the beast sequence. What's the beast doing? Making war on the witnesses, and then we're actually told that he conquers and kills them. That's the sequence. Here is the chronological order. The church, during the time that John's speaking, writing, the church is doing well. And the church is out there growing and prophesying and testifying and witnessing. And the beast is going to come up out of this bottomless pit and start making war on the church, but she's going to continue witnessing and testifying, okay? And they're going to testify until they are done. Whatever that was, I don't know. God knew, okay? They are testifying during this war, this spiritual war. And then after, after they have finished their testimony, that's when the beast conquers and kills them. So when you're looking at the beast sequence, it says the beast rose up out of the bottomless pit and made war. Right after that word war, just get in your mind, while the church is testifying. And when the church is done testifying, it's going to look like he has conquered her and killed her. On your outline, 
the beast that rises out of the bottomless pit is the persecu- it's represented by the persecuting power of Rome. The persecuting power of Rome manifested through her kings, her emperors. We're shown that in chapter 17. I would tell you to wait till we get there, but we've actually already dealt with chapter 17. In the second sermon in this whole series, remember I used chapter 17 to date this book. Five have fallen, and we know it's kings because your book tells you it's kings. Five have fallen, one is, one's about to come up, and then there is an eighth. The five that have fallen, Augustus, Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, and Nero. Every one of those men made Rome what she was. I mean, folks, if you read anything about history... Caligula was sick. I mean, that guy was deranged. He did not officially persecute Christians. He was too busy sinning in every other way. Okay? But when Nero gets to the throne, Nero officially brings on government sanctioned persecution against the church. Most of history will tell you that Nero wanted to build a really nice palace type building in the center of Rome. And so he accidentally caught the city on fire and burned sections of it to the ground, killed hundreds of people in the fire. And when the people of Rome obviously got mad about that, guess who Nero blamed? First government-sanctioned persecution went out against Christians. It's their fault that this happened. That evil cult, and that's what they were known as. And so Nero brings on the first official government persecution. He's the fifth in, Re- in Revelation chapter 17, he's the first beast, actually, the beast that was, but is not any longer. It's not just talking about any part of Rome. It's talking about the part of Rome that was crucifying and, and committing all these crimes against Christians. Nero commits suicide, and Rome falls into civil war. In 18 months, Rome goes through four emperors in 18 months. Three of them, the book of Revelation ignores, because basically three of them, history ignores. You can find out about them. One ruled for eight months. I think one ruled for seven months. One ruled for three months. And they were wiped out pretty quick. And then Vespasian comes to the throne, and he gets control of it, and he hangs on to control. And that who is in control, as John is receiving this revelation, Vespasian is the one who's in control. He takes the throne and solidifies it. He's in power. Titus, his son, is about to become emperor. Revelation says that the next emperor is only going to last a little while. History bears that out. Titus ruled for two months, two years, two months, and a few days. He got sick and he died. And so his brother then takes over. Brother, his brother is Domitian. Domitian is the eighth emperor mentioned in Revelation chapter 17. Domitian, folks, is the beast resurrected. He brings back Rome's persecuting powers to make war on the saints. And he begins to persecute the Christians with a vengeance. And that persecution that he starts with his power will continue for another 200 years. Off and on throughout the Roman Empire through the different emperors that come to power until God finally and completely and utterly destroys Rome. This is what John is seeing in his vision. But what does the death of the two witnesses mean? Because that's what we're shown here in chapter 11 on your outline. The death of the two witnesses. In verse 7 we're told about that death. There was a time in Christian Roman history when it did appear, this is on your outline, it did appear that Rome had won and Christianity was dead. Just like it appears in John's vision. Don't get these names mixed up. Domitian is going to be the one who comes to power. You got Vespasian in power now. His son Titus is getting ready to take over. Titus dies pretty quick. Domitian comes to the throne. Domitian takes the throne in 81 AD, and persecution almost begins instantly against the church. That persecution continues through all the other emperors, sometimes very intense, sometimes not so intense, until we get to the year 311 A.D. Diocletian, not Domitian, are you with me? Diocletian takes the throne around 300 A.D. 
in 303 A.D., Diocletian decreed that every Bible in the world should be destroyed. Every church should be leveled to the ground. Every Christian who will not recant should be executed. That is official Roman government policy in 302, 303, 304 A.D. Did you hear that? The worldwide empire at that time says every Bible is to be destroyed. Every church is to be leveled. Every Christian who will not recant is to be executed. In 303 A.D., Diocletian said that his persecution was so effective that in little over a year, he and his, his, he had a guy working with him, was so effective that they said that they had eradicated the Bible from the face of the earth in 303 A.D. Folks, I'm not telling you something you can't look up yourself and check all this out. Diocletian was told correctly, by the way, that Christians were a people of the book. Actually, scroll was the word used because that's what was still in. But they were a people of the book. And so his thinking correctly, by the way, was this. If I wipe out the book, I destroy the faith. And that's why his first, his first rule was get rid of every Bible. By 304 A.D., he had considered his efforts so successful that he displayed a large Latin Bible that had been burned, and he put a sign above that Bible. And in Latin, here's what that sign said, Extincto nomine Christianorum. Here's what it means in English. The name of Christian is extinguished. He also minted a coin right after that. The coin showed himself destroying the hydra. The hydra was a mythical monster from Greek mythology that had all these different heads, and the reason it was so hard to kill was because every time you cut a head off, remember, remember mytho uh, Greek mythology? What would happen when you cut the head off? More would grow back. Supposedly, Hercules killed the hydra. But on this coin, Diocletian shows himself killing the... By the way, that coin was really a compliment to Christians because you know who the hydra stood for? Christians. They admitted that they'd been so hard to kill that when he finally thought he had destroyed Christianity, he minted this special coin showing himself killing the hydra, the hydra being Christians. He minted the coin too soon, okay? Because, I don't know why I can't remember, but in 305, Diocletian abdicated the throne. He got off. In 311, he dies. In 311, his successor signs the Edict of Toleration, which for the first time in 200 years ended official persecution of Christianity. That's in 311. In 313, the Emperor Constantine signed the Edict of Milan, making it totally legal to be a Christian in the Roman Empire. It was now tolerated along with all the other religions. It finally becomes the religion of the empire. Are you following the prediction out of Revelation with what I just shared with you from history? And like I said, everything I told you out of history, folks, you can check out for yourself. Verse 8 says, Their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that symbolically is called Sodom and Egypt where the Lord was crucified. On your outline, when a person is executed and their bodies are left lying or hanging in the public area, what is that signifying? <laughs> Contempt and disdain for that person and all that they stood for. On April 28th, 1945, Benito Mussolini and his mistress were executed by the Italian people. His own people executed him. Then they took his corpse and the corpse of his mistress down to the public square and hung them upside down by their feet and left them hanging there for days. Why? Because the Italians hated him for what he had done to their country and what he brought them into. They disdained him. They had contempt for him, and so they left their bodies hanging there. Keep that in mind, okay? Because that's the message that's being sent here about Christians. There are not two literal bodies laying in the streets of Rome. 
It is signifying that Rome had zero respect for God's Word. I mean, look what Diocletian did. He displays this burned out Bible, and what's he say? I have extinguished the name of Christianity. That's how they felt about it. They hated Christianity. They're left to lie in the city that is symbolically called Sodom and Egypt, and where the Lord was crucified. Well, what city would that be? Jerusalem. Okay, but the great city being referred to in verse 8 is not Jerusalem. Jerusalem is being used as a symbol. All three places, and this is on your outline, all three places, Sodom, Egypt, and Jerusalem, are referring to Rome. All three are referring to Rome because each one of those places had a specific aspect that was characteristic of, of Rome. Egypt was the civil oppressor of God's people. Way back in the book of Exodus, you know that. There was official government policy that Hebrews were to be kept as slaves. They were the official oppressors of God's people. Well, guess what? So was Rome. Rome had official, an official edict to persecute Christians. Sodom was the central sexual seductive society that sucked people in. Well, guess what? So was Rome. Fred Cook, let me borrow the book um, by Bill O'Reilly. Killing Jesus. Good book. There are some things that O'Reilly said I didn't agree with, but for the most part it was an excellent book on history. And in that book, showing the time of his birth until his death, you ought to read what was going on in Herod's palace, who was representative of Rome during that time. I mean, there was some pretty sick stuff going on because Herod was under the influence of Rome. And so you see there the oppressive side of Egypt the seductive side of uh, Sodom. Well, why Jerusalem? Because Jerusalem represented the perverted religion. That's why. You think, well, wait, Judaism was the true religion. Well, it was up to a point, but the Jews didn't practice true religion. They perverted it. We're in the book of John in our Sunday school class, and we talked about last week what the Jews did to Jesus the day that He was, that he was crucified. They go to Pilate because they want Pilate to crucify him. They won't even enter into Pilate's house. Why? He's a Gentile. That's going to make them impure for that day, the special day of the Passover. Here's the deal. They're worried about ceremonial cleanness, uncleanliness, but they're going to be willing to uh, put to death a man that they know is innocent. And that, by the way, that afternoon they asked Pilate, can you go and break the legs of all the men on the cross? We don't want those people hanging on the cross when we're about to celebrate the Passover. Once again, they're worried about looks. And don't give a rip about executing a man that was innocent. They were perverted in their thinking. What do you have in Rome? You have Rome oppressing God's people officially. You have Rome being the sinful center of the world officially. You have, you have Rome having all these perverted religions officially. And so they're represented in all of these different uh, cities that are mentioned here in this uh, vision. Verses 9 and 10. For three and a half days those who dwell on earth, and by the way you know this already, dwell on earth means those who are ungodly. They will party and celebrate and rejoice over the dead bodies of the two witnesses. Why? Because while the Word of God and the people of God were active, they were tormenting those who dwell on earth. How? <laughs> Through the speaking of the Word of God. Folks, we see that today. People who want to live their sinful life the way they want to live it hate those who preach the Bible and who live the Bible out. And you see that going on today. Who did Hillary Clinton call the deplorables? Who did she call the deplorables? Those who cling to their guns and to their, their Bibles, folks. You see it today in the attitude of our politicians. They can't stand those people who cling to their Bibles. And so these people of the Roman Empire are rejoicing in the days of Rome, especially in the days of Diocletian, because to them the church is dead. He's wiped it out, and boy, they are partying. The three and a half days simply means that they will appear to be dead for a short, incomplete time. The beast authority and the war on the saints is described in three and a half years. Longer, but still temporary, still incomplete. The death of the two witnesses is three and a half days, a shorter incomplete time. The empires rejoicing over their death, basically what they're showing here is it's going to be short-lived. 
It's not going to last very long. Verse 11, God breathes life back into the two witnesses. This is on your outline. That illustration comes directly from Ezekiel chapter 37, where Ezekiel sees a valley full of dry bones. We sing a song, those are the days of Elijah. And in that same song it talks about, in the days of Ezekiel, see the dry bones. And some of you are probably thinking, what in the world? Dry bones? Well, if you go to Ezekiel chapter 37, Ezekiel is having a vision. And he's standing over this valley that is full of dry bones. And he suddenly sees something better than Hollywood could ever create. Sinew, muscle, skin starts to form on these skeletons and they come to life. And what it is is a vision of God resurrecting Israel. Because Ezekiel is writing during the days of Babylonian captivity. Israel's been wiped out. But in the vision, God's showing him, I'm going to resurrect my people Israel. And he shows it through this vision of him breathing life back into those dry bones in the valley, okay? What do we see here? Christianity has been wiped out. But what's the next vision? God breathes life back into the dead bodies laying there in the street. What's he mean by that? I'm going to revive Christianity. It's not dead. In fact, verse 10 tells us about the breath of life coming into them to raise them from the dead. And that's exactly what we see in verse 11. God putting breath into the life of his people to raise them back from the dead so they could continue to do this. Folks, I shared with this earlier that somewhere between 303 and 305 AD, Diocletian, the Roman emperor, has declared the word of God destroyed and the church of God dead. And yet six years later, just a measly six years later, his successor in 311 starts Rome surrendering by writing the Edict of Toleration. And in two short years after that, in 313, Constantine makes Christianity completely and officially legal in the empire of Rome. And by the way, before Constantine's death... Christianity is literally made the official religion of Rome. And even when the Goths and the Vandals and the Huns come in and wipe out the empire, guess what survives? The church. Revelation is right down the line. Verse 12, premillennialists and those who take Revelation literally say that these two witnesses will visibly be taken to heaven. I don't take that literal. I believe the two witnesses stand for the Word of God and the Church of God, and so I sure don't take verse 12 literally either. Yet before you brand me as a liberal, I want you to hear me out. I absolutely believe in the physical resurrection of the dead. What hope do we have without that? I've lost a lot of good family and friends that I fully expect to literally see again. I hope you believe the same way. So I fully believe in the visible, physical resurrection of the dead. I absolutely believe that those of us who are alive when Christ comes back will visibly see Jesus return as 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and chapter 5 tell us to, okay? We're going to literally meet Him in the air. I don't believe that this verse is referring to that. That's all I'm saying. Revelation is not talking about the end of the world. It's not talking about the second coming of Christ. That's what you have to remember. Other places are. Matthew chapter 25, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5, they are all talking about the second coming of Christ. Revelation is not. It's figurative and it's visual, okay? It's a vision going on here. And he's not talking about these two witnesses being literally going back up to heaven. John hears God calling the church for it to go to heaven. That's the vision, but what does it mean? Through the Roman world's eyes, God has resurrected the church. She is alive. And now through calling her to heaven, this is on your outline, He is empowering her to go forth to conquer. Folks, up until this part of the revelation, up until this part of the vision, the church has been fighting a defensive war. Spiritually speaking, okay? She's been doing nothing but trying to survive. That's a picture we've been given up to this point, if you agree on that, okay? She's just surviving. But now we get to chapter 11. They think she's dead, and what do we see happening? She is alive, and she is powerful. See, we see the church going on the offensive. 
and history bears that out as the empire crumbled around them the church spread throughout a great missionary endeavor and went way beyond the borders of the Roman Empire on your outline the enemy that's watching her go to heaven in this vision is simply showing God vindicating his church God vindicating his church one of my favorite movies is the man from Snowy River great movie there's a part after this horse gets loose and runs off with the wild herd, they bring a man in named Clancy. Remember? If you saw the movie. And all the cowboys talk about Clancy. And one of the guys says, you know, they, one guy says, well, who's Clancy? And they said, well, he's a horseman. And this one guy goes, oh, Clancy's not just a horseman. He's a magician. And then the main star of the movie, Jim Craig, he's standing there and he goes, uh, I met him once. And all these guys look at him like, what? And he goes, he and my dad were mates. Ah, yeah, right, you idiot. You know, they all start making fun of him. The next day, Clancy rides up. He gets off his horse. He walks up to Jim Craig, and he hands him the reins of the horse. He goes, Jim Craig? Yes, sir. Good to meet you. And he starts to walk off, and then Clancy turns around, and he says this. Sorry to hear about your dad. He was a good mate. You know what that's called? vindication Jim Craig had stated something true they all mocked him and made fun of him and the next day his truth was verified do you see what I'm saying the Roman Empire has called Christianity everything in the book and folks I mean if you look at what history they, they said that Christianity was atheism you know why because they didn't worship a visible God it's atheistic Christianity uh, practiced cannibalism. You know where that came from? The Lord's Supper. Because if you were not, and history bears this out, if you were not a baptized believer, you were welcome to come to the church assembly until the point of communion, and then you were asked to leave. Fred, you connected the two today in your communion meditation. That's perfect, because they are connected. Matthew chapter 23 and, and several other places connect them together. But if you were not a baptized believer, you were told to leave before they took communion. So all you heard as a guest of the church was something about the body and the blood. But if you weren't Christian, you didn't know what that really was all about. And so the rumor spread throughout the Roman Empire, Christians practiced cannibalism. They also, in the middle, of, or actually the Lord's Supper was taken in the middle of what they called a love feast. And so you were asked to leave before that love feast took place. And so also Christians were accused of having love orgies during their assembly. And those rumors picked up and spread throughout the Roman Empire. And so people, they had a very horrible view of Christianity. And how could this be anything of divinity? How can any divine power help this out? And then they hear one of their own emperors declare Christianity dead. And then within a few years, they see their own empire surrendering to Christianity. Vindication. And that's what you see going on here. By God in the vision calling his people up to heaven. Folks, that's not literally happening right then. I have to understand. All it's saying is, there's the vision. What's it mean? It means God is going to vindicate his people. It is a God thing. Verse 13 shows us that when the church resurrects, there will be great social upheaval represented by earthquakes, and that Rome will still be judged for what she did to the church, represented by a tenth of the city falling and 7,000 people dying. A tenth of the city falling shows that there's still just, it's just a partial judgment, there's more to come. The fact that 7,000 die, that doesn't mean a little 7,000 is going to die. It means that a great number is going to die. It's going to be a complete number that, that God has in His mind. This means people are going to die before I stop doing these things. That's what that means. And notice also the feeling of those who dwell on the earth. Earlier when the witnesses were dead, what do we see the people of earth doing? Woo! Partying, celebrating, rejoicing. Now what do we see going on with these same people in verse 13? They are terrified. They are glorifying God, and don't get mixed up. Glorifying God and repenting are not the same thing. Nebuchadnezzar nor glorified God, never repented as far as we know. They're not the same thing. All we're saying is, through this vision is, these people are acknowledging that everything's happening is from this God that the Christians follow. And then we come to verse 14. 
the second woe has passed. Woo, it's been a long time getting there, hasn't it, folks? <laughs> second woe has passed. Well, what was that second woe? Man, we're so far away from it. Here's the second woe. 200 million horsemen are going to gather on the Euphrates River, and they're going to come, and they're going to bash Rome to pieces. All right. Let's tie it together. Chapter 11 was a vision given <laughs> to comfort and encourage Christians. Now, I know as you're reading through there in chapter 10, 11, you're thinking, man, there's some tough stuff here. Yes, but the overall theme is we win. John's being told that the church is about to go through some hard times. Yet at the same time, he's being assured everything's going to be okay. He has told this message in two different ways. He has the vision of the city being trampled, yet the inner sanctuary being uh, protected and invulnerable. And then it's all happened at the same time. While the church is being trampled, it's also triumphant. The second vision that's given to him to show the same truth, different perspective, but same truth, is the two witnesses, the word in the church. They have a task to complete. They're going to prophesy for 1,260 days. That means that they're not going to be quiet, folks. This is for us. This is for us. If you don't catch anything else about today's lesson, catch this. What is so important about the 1,260 days and the two witnesses testifying during that time? They were doing it in the midst of persecution, and they would not shut up. There's a lesson for us today. As churches are being closed down, and Christians are told to be quiet. Don't even show your Bible in public. What did the witnesses do? They did exactly what God told them to do. What happened? War was made on them, but they did not stop. They are to preach the Word of God and continue to live faithful lives in an extremely hostile environment, and they do. And folks, not only do they do it, they do it successfully. The flip side of that is this. There is a price to pay. That high price is hinted at as the witnesses are told where they're wearing sackcloth. That's mentioned in verse 3. That high price is spelled out in verse 7 when we are told they are put to death. But it's only momentary. For God resurrects them and glorifies them. This whole scenario will be repeated with different visions in the succeeding chapters to continually show us living the Christian life is tough. You're going to have enemies. I appreciate the fact that Linda Bow continues to remind us we have enemies out there, folks. Don't ever think we don't. And yet at the same time, don't forget this. Revelation declares to us, even to this day, we win. We win. Would you stand with me, please? Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the courage, encouragement, the comfort that you bring to us through your word. Father, for those hard times, prepare us. Prepare us to stand firm. Prepare us to put up with things that would be very difficult to put up with. Prepare us for the long haul. Lord, help us never to give up, to never quit, to never turn our backs on you. Because we've already seen the outcome of the war. We win. Even when the world looked at it as though you had been totally defeated, as though your church was dead and your Bible was destroyed, they were wrong. We win. Thank you for the message of revelation. Help us to get it into our heart, to take it home with us, to live it out on a daily, daily lives. Father, help us to not forget the message that we've been given. That even though things are tough, they are never out of your control. You know what's going on. You love us. You will get us to where we need to be as we are faithful to you. Father, I want to pray for each person here at Christ Mission Church. I don't know where each person stands personally with you. But I know from what we see, not just in Revelation, but in your word, that your people will be tested. And each one will have to decide how committed they are to you. And I pray for each person here today, Lord, that they will resolve in their head and they will resolve in their heart that we belong to you. 
and that we'll stay faithful. Our example is your very son, Jesus Christ, who went to the cross, not for his sake, but for our sake. And we thank him for that. And we pray this in his name. Amen. With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Bye.